So, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, today's guest is uh, Mindy Mandel. Mindy, we're so happy having you here with us again. Yeah, it's great to be back. Good to see you again. Uh, Mindy Mandel um, has a master's degree in international relations from Boston University, USA. Close to 15 years, she worked in various companies in and around Tokyo, teaching English to business people. Uh, her interest in Plato began in the late 1990s. She met a teacher named Dr. Pierre Grimes, and she began studying with him and his group, the Noetic Society. Uh, she continues to study with him, always looking to keep going. Um, and the important thing is that she began writing Discovering the Beauty of Wisdom in 2016. That's her uh, marvelous book. Discovering the Beauty of Wisdom. I'm going to be talking about it today. I'm going to talk uh, uh, to be more precise. Uh, chapters, I'm going to focus on chapters two and four. Uh, and she also began her YouTube channel all about Platonism in June 2020. Mm -hmm. And there she aims to present Plato's works in the holistic spiritual framework that she introduced in her. Uh, Mini, so nice having you here with us again. It's a privilege. Oh, it's been, a pleasure to be here. We've been reading your book all along, and mm -hmm. we read it. Uh, uh, the more uh, interested in it we become. Um, I mean, there's so much to find in your book. Um, and um, thanks to your different approach. Uh, I mean, uh, according to Plato, as you uh, write down chapter two, uh, Plato says, do not the manner of expression and the words correspond with the character of the soul. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, what a nice phrase to, uh, uh, mm -hmm. to begin your chapter entitled A Different Approach. And uh, you clearly state that as children, we raised um, by our parents, and we are prone to believe in certain um, things and religious stuff without questioning them. And then we grow older and older, and um, uh, we never question those ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, this did not apply to you. I mean, uh, when did you start asking questions about uh, God and justice? Uh, well, I, and, oh, please. I'm sorry. Please finish. Yeah. And um, how did you feel when you realized that uh, I'm not happy with what I'm being mm -hmm. told? Uh, mm -hmm. Something is missing and I want to find out the mystery hidden, hidden behind. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think... Most of us as children, we we don't, I mean, like very small children, we're not going to question God. I don't know too many five-year-olds who are thinking, is my family's religion correct? You know, we just kind of accept it at those very young ages. But there is some point where I think all of us have some questions, even people who end up embracing their family's religion and following it in the same way, they have to, I think, go through some degree of that kind of questioning. Um, maybe people who would read a book such as mine would be the type who question it more <laughs> than, um, than those um, who just embrace the family's religion and follow. Um, but um, yeah, like in my case, maybe by high school, for sure, I was raising a lot of questions. And like in the case of my family, um, I grew up in a Jewish home, but we didn't really practice the religion very openly. We did the holidays and, you know, I had sort of a very uh, cursory introduction to the religion, but it wasn't like we went to shul every single week and we didn't keep kosher or any of those sorts of things. And so there was a certain hypocrisy to it where we're told that the Bible is like the word of God, but we don't follow it. It doesn't make any sense, right? And so there are lots of things. And I see this also with like a lot of Christians around me, people of other religions. Um, they also 
follow the holidays and say that the Bible was written by God and there are certain teachings that they absolutely believe, but then other things that they don't like in the Bible, they just ignore those parts. And so it just seems like there's a lot of hypocrisy. And so um, like a lot of high school kids, I had a great number of questions and a lot of doubt. Yeah, I, I definitely went through a period of being rather cynical. By my university years, I would describe myself as agnostic and um and i think and i grew up in like the 80s and 90s like i was i graduated high school in 1990 so i was in university in the early 90s and that was a time when science was the religion of the educated you know it's like people yeah. are embracing the idea of science over religion and so i was very much caught up in that and humanism was taking hold and i was swept up in that for a little while yeah yeah, I would like to, to talk about your university years in a few uh, mm. a few uh, minutes. Sure. Uh, so uh, you're saying that some people are uh, driven, are raised to believe in a certain way um, due to the fact that there is um, actually an absence of how-to manual, uh, which could go along with the advice. And uh, is, mm. is, is this uh, uh, due to the teacher's... Um, uh, mistakes. Um, um, is there something wrong with um, uh, education? Think that there's such an absence of uh, um, navigation and um, ample argumentation of um, the Bible or uh, the Testaments, let's say, uh, writings? Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, you know, I would say that's a big problem with re with. The way that religion is generally introduced to us is we're told there are certain behaviors that we should take on. You should do this. You should not do that. But we're not taught the state of mind of a person who would just naturally think that way. And so especially when when you consider that we grow up in societies where we're, we see that like prosperity is valued and social status and there are all these values that are in contradiction with the religious teachings. And so we're told that like we, sh we shouldn't be greedy. We, it's okay to want prosperity, but don't be greedy or um, don't be jealous of other people. And, and we're not taught the state of mind of someone who would naturally think this way. And I think that's what makes Platonism very attractive to me, what originally drew me to it is that Plato doesn't focus on the behaviors. What he focuses on is the state of mind, but the study of the nature of reality, recognizing that goodness is at the root of reality. And being in line with that is what it means to be virtuous. And so learning the state of mind and the virtues, and by studying these, um, we just naturally are going to grow in a way that it seems very obvious to us then what is desirable to us and what is not, what is healthy for us as soul. When you know yourself to be a soul, as opposed to identifying closer with the body, like conventional thinking is that we are the body and we have mind or soul or some such various beliefs. Um, but um, when you know yourself in essence, to be a spiritual being and to want to live in line with that truth, then your notion of what is desirable for you, what is good for you is going to shift. And it's a very natural shift when you're living this way, as opposed to trying to force yourself to fit some image of goodness that you heard about in a book. Yeah. So, yeah. And mm -hmm. definitely, it doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not enough right. to mm -hmm. uh, to find an answer or to shift mm -hmm. your own beliefs. Uh, if you happen right. to be a um, mm -hmm. high school student uh, right. or even a university student, mm -hmm. because as you uh, correctly said... Or even a middle-aged person. <laughs> <laughs> um, even academics find mm -hmm. hard to, difficult to, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. sort of uh, ad uh, adapt to you know, mm -hmm. some uh, some other uh, norms. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, during your, your university years uh, mm -hmm. and during everyone's university years, 
Um, academics are usually proud of students' marks. Um, students themselves feel great when they get rewards, excel at mm -hmm. certain fields. Mm -hmm. uh, but you told us that you're not happy with, with that. I mean, um, uh, you were taught about organized religion. Um, uh, this term, organized religion, didn't seem to, um, to like... Um, um, your own uh, um, taste. I mean, uh, do you think that the concept of organized religion and the dogma of religion as make believe often leads to misbeliefs or false beliefs in contrast to self discovery of the truth and one's spiritual fight for his own purpose in life? Oh, absolutely. I mean, just to follow dogma, even where there's right opinion in that dogma, you may not understand it. And you, you there's a lot of room for misunderstanding or for an interpretation that takes it away from what it was meant to be, what it's actually pointing to. And um, yeah, so yeah, I found organized religion um, woefully inadequate that we're all just doing our best. That's what people would say to me, that we're all just doing our best. Nobody knows the truth. Nobody can, there is no truth or um, nobody can know it. We're all, you know, we're only human. We're these, you know, tiny little creatures who can't possibly understand anything such as the divine. And um, yeah, there was just something not satisfying about the kinds of answers yeah, that I was getting back then. And the as to bring that into the, the idea of academic life, yeah, just like getting grades and then you there's like a pattern you're supposed to follow. You go to school, you get good grades, you get a good job. Maybe you get married and have a family. Or there's all these things you're supposed to do. But it all just seemed, um, at least at that time in my life, I think because I didn't have a spiritual side to my life, this was like, especially like in university years was my agnostic years. And it all just felt very shallow. It felt meaningless. There was something arbitrary about it all. And so, yeah, none of it felt satisfying to me. Um, on the other hand, there, are, uh, there is um, humanism, uh, which claims that, okay, the divine does not affect our lives uh, so much. So don't bother find out the answers. All that counts is... Uh, to feel compassion for other human beings or live in a way that is moral and ethical. Um, after all, is it all about caring and being compassionate about others and nothing more? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that was attractive to me for, I, I often say it's about five minutes, but maybe it was two weeks. Um, but yeah, that one wore off very quickly because it is attractive on the surface. But then I think, well, why should we be compassionate? And I don't mean it as like a heartless question, like as if it's wrong to be compassionate. I do feel compassion when I see like disasters in the news. Yeah. I don't know people, wants. you know, halfway around the world and I don't know them, but I feel compassion and there is something that pulls us. And the answers that we often get through humanism is that it's just chemical reactions in the body. And like, we're just robots, you know, and yeah. if that's really all compassion is, if that's all love is, then it still feels meaningless. But mm -hmm. there was something in me that just intuited that there is more. Now, that doesn't mean there is more just because I feel that way, but it's at least a reason to look elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It's a reason to say that, you know what, I just, I have this sense that humanism doesn't have all the answers, that there is something more, there is something real about love and compassion. There is something that connects us. We are more than physical. And I wasn't happy with the religion answers. And for me, religion and spirituality are very different, right? Religion, there has to be some core belief that ties people together. And you can be religious without being spiritual. Spiritual is more of a personal thing. It has to do with your own experience. And so you can be religious, but not be spiritual. 
And you can be spiritual without being religious. And of course, you can be both religious and spiritual. So to me, they're very different. And so I had this, maybe I intuited that spirituality is something real, even though I rejected religion. And it left me in this sort of abyss where I didn't quite know what to do, because this was long before the internet and the explosion of mysticism on the internet. Um, it was very hard to learn about things like like Eastern religions, like Buddhism or Hinduism. And I knew nothing about Plato beyond what was taught in universities, which is the secular version of, of Platonism. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. um, I really, I had the sense, but I didn't know where to look. Yeah, so I was in this abyss at those years. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so mm. everything has to do with uh, God and this. Mm -hmm. uh, love and hate relationship about mm -hmm. God. Uh, so uh, it's often the case that people mm -hmm. want to reject God mm -hmm. uh, and they blame God for everything. But mm -hmm. is it actually uh, the case that people want to reject God or some other interpretations that people give to the divine power? Mm. And uh, how can we search uh, for answers and how shall we interpret um, in the correct way um, mm. our own uh, ideas and opinions about God? Mm. Yeah. Well, um, what I would say is that a lot of the arguments that I have heard from atheists are really rejections of the Bible. Like they'll say that in the Bible, it says that God killed lots of people. Um, so why would God kill people? Um, or they would they would point to a certain story in the Bible and criticize that story. That's not actually a rejection of God. That's a rejection of this interpretation of God. And or they would say that, hey, no, all these different religions are fighting each other. So all these gods are fighting. And so, you know, it doesn't make any sense. There must be no God. And I'd say, no, these are just ideas about God that people are fighting about. But if there is a creator, that creator is beyond all of these different arguments and is independent of them and doesn't really, and is not affected by them. And so those are not arguments against God, only arguments against various interpretations of God. And so what's, what Plato does is he takes a very different approach of looking at what are we, and looking at through metaphysics, what has to be true about the nature of reality and working from that and then, um, putting off the conclusions, if you will, and, and searching yourself, um, uncovering your own assumptions and working in this very different way and trusting that if you continue with sincerity and integrity, you're going to start uh, reaching understanding and seeing the world in a different way and the conclusions about how we should live our lives is going to gradually unfold. And there is a certain trust that it will happen. And um, I've been doing this for over 20 years now, and I'll say that um, trust is well-placed. I think it, it does start to unfold. Excellent. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, um, this is the way mm -hmm. that Plato has already uh, mm -hmm. taught us uh, through mm -hmm. his writings. Mm -hmm. He is the one who developed a spiritual system that can be applied to all human beings, whatever mm -hmm. the religion, uh, whatever religion mm -hmm. they may be, whatever the social status they are. Um, mm -hmm. So Plato's approach is plays a key role uh, for uh, everyone of us who wants to uh, take a closer look uh, mm -hmm. at uh, uh, this spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to um, to ask you uh, one aspect of um, um, Plato's approach, which has to do with um, uh, sacrifice. Um, mm -hmm. Just to um, get a better understanding of the myths and the level of wisdom that you can attain. For instance, 
Um, what about donations? Do donations per se are supposed um, um, say um, do donations per se save your soul? Is donating as an act uh, considered to be a good deed which can free you from your evils and erase your hidden and sinful past um, as an act of purification of the soul? But is it enough? Is it enough for everyone to donate, uh, or somebody uh, would have to think even deeper and uh, consider Plato's um, idea um, mm. of uh, sacrifice, which actually means to make something sacred? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. We often um, think of sacrifice as giving something. Right. So, of course, in the old days, they would maybe kill an animal as a sacrifice. Um, in modern days, sacrifice is more like maybe donating food or clothing. Um, the more sincere it is, the, the, if you actually like, like I use the example of like a coat that you still love and want to wear. But to give that as a donation, um, there's a certain feeling of pride. In, in doing so. And so there is a sense of sacrifice there. Um, and, but it's only a purification or it's only, um, it only has that higher meaning in a symbolic way. It doesn't actually, like it's um, to your question, it doesn't actually purify you. It doesn't clear away your, I, I don't use the word evil, but um, it doesn't clear away your false beliefs and the things that hold you back. Um, but so the idea of, um, of sacrifice for Plato is to make yourself sacred, to donate yourself, if you will, um, to um, make yourself really as if we offer ourselves, we might say on our, on our spiritual quest, that's what it means to give yourself. And so that means to um, make you to, in the study of philosophy, we want to understand the nature of reality, understand it as goodness, and to make ourselves as like that as is possible. Or what Plato says in a few of his dialogues is to make yourself as godlike as is humanly possible, which really just means um, to cultivate the virtues and to, to grow into this wiser, healthier version of yourself to be the healthiest version of yourself that you can be and to dedicate your life then to a life of philosophy one that you engage in with sincerity with integrity and wholeheartedly yeah and uh at that point i'd like to read uh, uh, hmm. a short extract from uh, your book having to do with sacrifice mm -hmm. uh, especially the one that says um, I would suggest, have, however, that Plato's meaning in the Republic goes even further. He made the statement about giving a great and wonderful sacrifice in the context of discussing mythology. So uh, he actually uses this sense to, um, um, let's say, um, to make it known, um, mm -hmm. to make the myths known to the general public. And um, so uh, in order to do, to do this, um, he say, you say that people need to reach some degree of initiation to spiritual matters in order to see beyond the common understanding of mythology. So uh, does this mean that you have to be initiated into some kind of uh, um, mystic um, ideas? And how, how could you possibly do it in, in simple terms? Yeah, well, when I say initiated, I don't mean like a formal ceremony. It's more that you have to go beyond the surface story of mythology to recognize the metaphysics behind it, because there are deeper meanings to these stories. On the surface, mythology presents the gods as being jealous and... Um, greedy and lustful, and they behave in ways that we would never tolerate from humans, let alone gods. 
And so it's very hard to look at these mythological stories and see anything spiritual, see anything meaningful. But when you get into the metaphysics of these studies, then you start to see that the stories initiate you into um, these deeper studies. And when you start to contemplate these, that's the initiation that we need is the, the contemplation, the turning inward and the contemplation of what these stories actually mean. So it depends on how you read the book, how you read the myth. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, like the great sacrifice that's talked about in the Republic is you have to give up your ignorance, basically. Um, give that up and sacrifice yourself to your um, to your studies, to give yourself to these studies, dedicate yourself to this life and really go into it deeply. So you have to be wise enough mm -hmm. to uncover the true meanings which are hidden underneath. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, the wisdom is developed gradually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, yes. Now, a lot of people uh, mm -hmm. make this kind of distinction. I mean, uh, in between smart, a smart guy, a clever guy, a wise guy. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, many, many people um, uh, think that these three adjectives are uh, almost synonyms. Mm -hmm. uh, but they do have some kind of uh, uh, differences. Uh, them. So, um, spirituality now, um, do you think that, um, and also there's another uh, uh, distinction between spirituality and mysticism. Mm -hmm. Now, um, first, first of all, um, what do you have to be to, uh, uh, to approach um, uh, spirituality? I mean, do you have to be a smart guy, a clever guy, uh, a wise guy? And what about mysticism then? How do you um, jump uh, from spirituality into mysticism? Hmm. Okay, well, there's a lot there. Let me see how to do this. Um, okay, so first, um, when I talk about spirituality, I mean that personal experience that we are more than body. And there are many ideas that would fall into this is a very wide umbrella. Some people um, still identify closely with the body, but think there is something more. Um, some people would say that we are bodies, but we have a soul and they focus more on the soul. And eventually you get to what I would, maybe the extreme there, which would be what I would call mysticism, which is the idea that we don't, we're not a body that has a soul. We are soul, our essence is spiritual or divine, or there are various ideas here, but that would all fall under the umbrella of mysticism, a stream of consciousness, uh, a soul, a spirit. There are many different ideas, but we are that in essence. And the body is just a vessel that carries us. And usually people who um, embrace some sort of mysticism will also then include the idea of reincarnation in their teachings and in their beliefs. And so that's mysticism. Um, as for the idea of clever versus wise, I'd say you don't have to be, you don't have to have a high IQ to be spiritual or to be a mystic. Um, and having a high IQ does not mean that you're going to be wise. To be wise means that you are focused on what is true and good, that you're focused on the nature of reality and that you are living in line with that okay that's that's the development of wisdom the way plato talks about wisdom is it's this is the virtue that is most closely associated with the logos of the soul or the the wisdom loving part of the soul and it's the part of the soul that he considers it the smallest part but it's the part that should lead us it's the ruler of the soul in a healthy soul and it's the part that is focused on the nature of reality it's where the cognitive functions, um, on, um, right opinion, understanding, knowing, and we're developing these, um, trying to understand the nature of reality and living in line with that. So you can have a high IQ, but um, be very focused on making money or um, 
having popularity or whatever, that's not what it means to be wise. Okay, so being intelligent or clever and being wise are two very different things. Right, and it all has to do uh, with embracing uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the best way uh, uh, to embrace philosophy, according to you, is mm -hmm. to be wise enough uh, to clarify the meanings on your own as time passes, little by little, mm -hmm. day by day. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and the important thing is to uh, always recognize the false images uh, we usually pick up in our childhood. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, our own assumptions as we clear away what is false, then we will naturally develop um, better ideas. Then um, new insights will come to us and we'll so we'll naturally develop healthier attitudes. And um, and I think that as we we carry on in this way, we will find what works well as we're clearing away what is false. And maybe if we're not, if we don't know what we want to do with our lives, it's often because we have these contradictory images of what we think society wants, what our parents want, what society wants, what we think we're supposed to want. And when we're clearing away these kind of false beliefs, then we're naturally going to clear away a lot of that as well. And the natural wisdom of the soul has a way of surfacing and so we do absolutely find a path that that works for us and yeah this is a big part of the journey to know thyself journey so it's the journey not the destination mm -hmm. after all and you definitely yeah. <laughs> i don't know there's an end i don't know there is a destination <laughs> and uh you give a very uh, a crystal clear uh, recipe uh for this you're talking about the four cardinal virtues. Hmm. Uh, and that's the, um, you know, the most important uh, part of all uh, for everyone hmm. to consider what exactly uh, is the role of these four cardinal virtues, starting from wisdom, then moving on to fortitude, um, and then temperance and... Uh, justice as mm -hmm. the thread uh, that um, uh, the common thread that um, links all these uh, virtues to, together. I, I mean, uh, this is an incredible recipe so long as uh, the average person has um, um, gets the, uh, you know, gets a general understanding. Uh, could you please um, uh, explain us um uh, these uh, cardinal virtues one by one okay sure um just a brief overview is first one is wisdom this is the one again that's generally associated with the logos part of the soul so plato has the idea of the tripartite soul so wisdom is associated with the logos of the soul which is where the cognitive functions function right opinion understanding and knowledge this is the ruler, the leader of the soul. And the idea here is that we're focusing on the nature of reality and bringing ourselves in line with that goodness. Courage then is, he Plato describes it as like a guard dog that defends its master, which is wisdom, the wisdom loving part of the soul. So this is generally associated with the thumos of the soul. And this is, it's sometimes translated as anger, which is not quite an accurate um, translation, but it's the part of the soul that is sometimes called the high-spirited part. And the mm -hmm. ideal here is that this is the part of the soul that keeps us focused on the nature of reality and on our studies, and it doesn't let us get distracted by pleasures or scared away by things that frighten us. And it, we just stay focused. So pleasures can be probably the most distracting. Um, fears have their own um, whole, like the, especially the fear of the unknown can be um, quite scary to people. And so there are certain fears that can keep us away from studying or we don't, there are some rocks we may not want to look under um, in our studies. And But we have to have courage to do so. 
And then pleasures are very distracting. It's easy to get caught up in something else. And when things are going well, once you've cleared away some false beliefs and your life is running a little smoother, it's very easy to let many people get off track. They do this for a little while and then they get off track as now they can achieve those social successes that they've been wanting. And so they go off from philosophy. But to be truly courageous is to stay focused on the nature of reality. And then there's temperance. And temperance is often associated with that third part of the soul, the epithumia. This is the desiring or appetitive part of the soul. Although maybe more accurately, though, temperance is associated with all three parts. It's about a harmony and concord of all three parts. The idea is that once we've gained some wisdom, once we start, once it's taken hold, where it's beyond just a right opinion, where you start to really get some understanding and it starts to really sink in and become the way you see the world, now you're going to find that your desires are going to fall in line with wisdom. When you understand yourself as a spiritual being and you understand this to be a healthy life, you're, you're naturally going to desire that which is healthy for you because it will just feel good. Mm -hmm. Whereas things that you used to desire before, which may not be so good for you, they you're going to start to outgrow those things. And so maybe in the early years, we tend to have the image of temperance as like repressing your desires or denying the things you want. But true temperance is when there is no battle, where you just naturally desire what is healthy for you. And then you've got justice, which ties it all together. Justice is defined by Plato as each of the, the three parts of the soul carrying out their own proper function with their own proper in their own proper place and harmony and whatnot. And so when we're living in this way, this is the healthiest version of the soul. And this is the condition of soul in which we're going to find ourselves excelling then in our philosophical practice. So once this takes hold, this is when our practice really starts to mature and this becomes just the way we see the world, right? Because early on, I think it's very normal that you're going to do this for a little while. You get excited about something and then you get distracted and you get caught up in life, whether it's tests at school or stressful things at work or something fun going on, you're going to get distracted and go off and eventually come back to philosophy. And what we find is over time, our periods away get shorter. The times that we're immersed in philosophy begin to grow until eventually we find that this just becomes the way we see the world. And so it's very natural to just live this way all the time. Uh, it's very impressive uh, the way uh, uh, you write um, about these four cardinal virtues uh, and depict Plato's writings in a very expressive and descriptive way. Um, just uh, which one of these four virtues you th uh, do you think is the most um, important? <laughs> That's a hard one to say because... Yeah. If you're missing any of them, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. But I suppose that, um, well, certainly we need to be guided by wisdom. That's the one that leads the others. Um, if you, um, courage is following wisdom in the sense that it's what protects it. And temperance follows wisdom in the sense that the desires fall in line with wisdom. And then justice holding them all together, um, that one also, um, yeah. yeah, that one also could be said is the most important the one that holds them all together because it's certainly yeah. without justice the others wouldn't take hold in uh, the first place. Um, so they're all really all interconnected. If you're um, missing any of them, you're in trouble. Yeah, mm -hmm. we would agree with you that justice mm -hmm. is the common mm -hmm. uh, the common uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. thread that uh, uh, links them all together. They're consisting mm -hmm. of, consisted of uh, logos, mm -hmm. the reasoning part. Uh, mm -hmm. tied to the divine, and then mm -hmm. thymos, as you said, the high-spirited part, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, is the bodyguard for our love of mm -hmm. wisdom, and then epithemia, um, 
uh, which is generally associated with the temperance, as you uh, mm -hmm. correctly said. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, indeed, there is an interconnectedness uh, and inter uh, intertwining and interweaving these all uh, virtues. Mm -hmm. um, and the soul, um, uh, as a result, the soul that enjoys this balance uh, is um, actually in a state of uh, justice. Um, so the, the virtues are also the goal of our practice. Hmm. And the, yes. um, the Republic is probably the closest thing to a guidebook that Plato gave us as far as the education of the soul. And that's where he introduced the, the virtues as I just described them here. And so for a Platonist, then the um, contemplating what he wrote, like reading Plato's dialogues and contemplating the way he introduced these virtues um, is a big part of our practice. For us reading, is it's more that it's not like the way we read in university where we just want to get information. Yeah. We're reading in a more theurgic way where we're really internalizing it and letting it change us. And we're contemplating what we're reading and thinking about how this applies to our lives. And so then thinking about how he introduces the virtues and then how would you apply that in your work life, in your school life and so on. So what we find is that the virtues are the, um, in one sense, you can think of like the introduction of the virtues is what brings us into the state of mind of philosophy, brings us into this life. And it's the initial questioning of what we had not questioned as children. And we're going through that process and it's what brings us into this state of mind. But then we find that they gradually develop. And so the full culmination, the fullest flowering, if you will, of these virtues is, um, is if, it, if there to any degree that we can have a goal, that we can talk of a goal, because I don't know that there's an end, but to the degree that we can talk of a goal, it is the fullest flowering of these virtues. We start with right opinion about the virtues. And over time, as we're reading different dialogues and we're contemplating and talking with people and doing all the things that Platonists do, then we're developing understanding. And then eventually, ideally we will, um, it'll blossom into experience where we'll start to really live it and really feel it in our lives and really have this change in state of mind. And that's when it starts to really flower. And, and uh, the most important thing of all, as you, uh, as you write, is to discern the difference between good and bad, evil, uh, because um, discussions of justice and what is good or bad should not be read um, through our conventional usage of these words, as you say. Um, Platonism focuses what is healthy or unhealthy for the soul. So does this mean that um, for all of us to get a good grasp of what is healthy unhealthy for our soul does it mean that we um we don't have to be afraid of the evil because um our true nature uh is not rooted in evil after all mm -hmm. uh because the divine is the good and only only mm -hmm. only if we uh only if we start uh, uh thinking like that um mm -hmm. we will eventually get to the truth. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, there's no idea of a devil in Platonism. And rather than talking about evil as if it's something in our nature, we talk about ignorance as false beliefs that we've learned that are blocking us from knowing our true self. Yeah, so one of the fears that some people have getting into this is they fear that they're going to discover that they really are evil, that they have some evil in their soul, that that is their nature. But that is not at all consistent with Platonism and anything that I've ever found. Um, that's whatever um, ugly thoughts we may have stem from 
ignorance, from false beliefs about ourselves or about the nature of reality. Yeah, and so that's where courage comes in. Yes. Exactly. And that's the first step, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, often the most difficult one to make. I mean, mm -hmm. how, how to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the most difficult part for um, <laughs> almost uh -huh. um, everyone. Um, how to start? Maybe start with a channel like yours, watching <laughs> interviews like this. And um, some of the early dialogues, like the apology is one that's, that many people start with, or some of the early dialogues thinking about questions like, you know, what is virtue? Can it be taught? That's like the Mino. Or um, uh, what is um, what is likeness? What is courage? So a lot of the early dialogues are dealing with these sorts of questions. And this gets us thinking about these sorts of things and questioning ourselves. Amazing, amazing. An amazing interview. Um... Again, with uh, Mindy Mandel, we've been talking about discovering the beauty of wisdom. Um, we re definitely recommend uh, you this book. Uh, it has to do with embracing mysticism, the ancient path of Greek uh, philosophy. Uh, Mindy Mandel, uh, it's been a pleasure again having you here with us. Uh, talking about how to discover the beauty of wisdom uh, through your uh, writings, uh, through your marvelous book. Oh, thank you very much. I enjoy talking about it. Hope to have you again uh, mm -hmm. uh, in one of our uh, next uh, meetings. Oh, and so uh, talk again about another chapter of your book. Hmm. To be continued. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, our wonderful interview. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you. Have a nice afternoon. You too.